good morning and sorry for the slight delay. I was just showing, taking him around the building. Um, and clearly he was not too impressed, so bad idea. But uh, good morning <laughs> and uh, welcome to this morning conversation with Mr. Gaurav Dalmir, who I'm going to introduce shortly. But I'll, let me very quickly uh, share with you the reason why I wanted to do this conversation. I think um, over the years that I've spent here, I've realized that increasingly uh, the interaction between uh, some of our uh, faculty and policy folks with business leaders is far is much fewer is much is much uh, uh, less frequent than it should be uh, we still talk about them and we write about them and we sometimes also take uh, uh, positions which are antagonistic vis-a-vis uh, -vis business and private sector uh, we i don't think we have engaged with them enough I'm not saying that you need to change your mind about them. They still might be terrible folks. But I think let's arrive at that conclusion based on a few more interactions. And I think one of our efforts would be to bring people in who've been working on, uh, who've been working in the industry, who've been working in various sectors. Some of the sectors are cl clearly critical for uh, uh, India's own growth story and of course our, um, uh, our economy. Uh, and more importantly, uh, uh, businesses increasingly play a very important role in the social order as well, in the social, in, in many ways executing the social contract as well. Uh, uh, they run uh, uh, organizations that are undertaking uh, all sorts of activities including food, health, nutrition, skilling, education, gender empowerment and much more. Uh, uh, and uh, in that sense, in many ways they are also allies of some of the social policy posi positions that we may be advocating in our own research. So uh, they're good, for, good people to interact with, good people to engage with. And I think uh, uh, think tanks need to uh, see them as an important stakeholder in uh, much of the work. I don't think uh, we have worked hard enough to bring many of them into these more intimate conversations. We see many of them in the big conferences we host. We see many of them come and give speeches from a distance. I think it's time to make it more intimate. It's time to humanize them uh, uh, and, and uh, perhaps also uh, hope many of you can separately reach out to Gaurav uh, and have more uh, detailed discussions in areas that he's interested in and in areas that you work on. Um, he is, uh, let me, by way of introduction, he's the chairman of the Dalmia Group Holdings, a holding company for business and financial assets. It invests in private equity, real estate, public markets, structured debt, and fixed income. He's an early investor in and a board member of True North, a leading Indian private equity fund which manages $3.5 billion. He is the founder and chairman of Landmark Holdings, a real estate investment firm. He uh, has also co-founded GTI, a long-term investment vehicle for India-focused investments. Uh, he is a board member of Brookings India and a member of the governing board of the Institute of New Economic Thinking in New York. So he's not someone who's alien to the think tank world. He's, uh, he's intimately engaged in two or three institutions. He's chairman of the Indian Advisory Board of the Room to Read, a global education charity, and he commits and invests his resources and time in promoting education and skilling. That's something that he can also speak to us about. He writes regularly, so he's a contributor to the Economic Times, the Times of India and Financial Times. He's also on Twitter, please follow him. And uh, in 2000, he was selected as a global leader for tomorrow by the World Economic Forum. Uh, he's uh, honors MBA from the Columbia Business School. Uh, this is by way of introduction. Uh, and I had requested uh, Mr. Dalmia to speak on uh, rethinking business leadership in the 21st century, post which we will have time to ask him a few questions. I'm going to ask him the easy ones around CSR, Indian economy, and a couple of others. But please do chime in and uh, do uh, post questions to him. He's here with us till 12, 12.15? 12 12.15. 12 yeah, so he's here with us for that time. Gaurav, over to you. Thank you, Samik. So good morning. So since I have to win you guys over, let me wish you a belated uh, International Beer Day, <laughs> which was yesterday. Uh, the topic given to me is thinking business leadership in the 21st century. So when I was thinking about this topic last week, I kind of broke it up into three parts. Uh, business leadership as a country, business leadership as a business community, and business leadership or leadership at a personal level, uh, whatever business or vocation we may choose to have. So let me address it and in that order, if I may. So I'm a professional optimist, and I will not start as an optimist, but you will realize as I go through that 
I'm an optimist. And the reason I'm an optimist is more things are right about what's happening in our country or in the world than they are wrong. So if we focus on what's not right, we can easily get seduced by that. But I think more things are right. So let me step back into 1990, the year of our liberalization, you know, the decade our liberalization started. And we were having a discussion um, in that year, and somebody said, Gaurav, we have a problem. I was talking about India. And he said, when we got independence, we were trying to catch up with Europe in the 50s and 60s. In the 70s and 80s, we realized Japan is taking over the world in some ways, and we were trying to catch up with Japan. In the 90s, which had just started, we are trying to catch up with Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, etc., etc. And if we continue on this path, we'll end up catching with Vietnam in 2020. It scared the hell out of me when he said that, a friend of mine said that. But if I look at the facts, the truth is, today we are catching up with Vietnam. It sounded like a good joke at that point, but it sounds like a bad joke today. Okay, so let me give you some statistics. Per capita income, Vietnam, 2,700 odd dollars. Per capita India, 2,100 odd. Since 1990, their per capita is up 28x. Ours is up 6x. Okay, that's the transformation. So this sets a standard. I'm saying this not to put ourselves down, but to set a standard of what countries can achieve, what India ought to achieve. And we'll come to how in a, in a bit. Uh, absolute GDP growth. This was per capita, which I just told you, but absolute GDP growth since 1990. India, 8.37x. Bangladesh, 8.67x, slightly higher than India. Vietnam, 37x. So it's a complete outlier. So when you run a long race, if you run a marathon, there's this concept of breaking away. Groups just break away and they break ahead. Right? Vietnam happens to be one of those breaking away uh, uh, countries. Now, why can't all of us simply copy Vietnam? Right? Warren Buffett actually made an interesting comment on businesses, but it's attributable to countries as well. So Warren Buffett said, anyone can copy me, but people don't, because people don't like to get rich slow. So what sounds like a 37x growth for Vietnam today was actually not 37x in one shot. It was an everyday effort, an everyday impro incremental improvement, and everyday hard work. Right. So and Warren Buffett says that's what people don't want to do. They somehow want a magic potion that will give them this 37x uh, uh, growth. Now, if you just focus on Vietnam for a second, they made tremendous investments in primary education. Labor productivity today in Vietnam is far better than in other countries. Uh, they invested in infrastructure. So we know the playbook in many ways, but they did that consistently over time. Okay. So let me just focus on two things, one on apparel as a sector, and I'll compare India and Bangladesh, and then US-China trade and where the advantages of the US China trade wars are flowing. So I didn't know this. My wife is in the apparel business until my wife educated me. India's apparel exports are 16 odd billion dollars a year. Bangladesh is two times that. Bangladesh is the size of Haryana. It's two times that. Okay. So again, it's their labor. They're part of FTAs with Europe and this, that, and the other. And that mix is potent. And well, apparel is a big employment generator for every rupee spent mm -hmm. in the apparel industry in terms of capex. They employ a lot more people than a cement company or a steel company or a petrochemical company. Now, let's come to the China-US uh, trade wars. So Nomura did an analysis of which countries are benefiting the most. And India ought to be in that race trying to benefit. As per Nomura, Vietnam, Taiwan, a lot because of electronics business transfer. Chile, Malaysia, and most surprising to me was Argentina, or maybe even Bangladesh, but I'm just going through the list that I saw. And India was insignificant. 
in the gains coming. These are early days, of course, right? So there's a lot of uh, trade transfer that will happen. And India is well positioned to play that. And I'll leave it to him to tell us how later. So there's a reverse Q&A. Yeah? If you look at, if we look at the, the UNDP Human Development Index, it comprises of three parameters. One is longevity, healthy life, etc., etc. Second is knowledge, and the third is standard of living. They have various categories: very high, high, medium, and so on and so forth. There are fifty-nine countries in the very high. You have the usual suspects: the European, Western uh, countries. Malaysia in it, is in it, by the way. You have high, which is 60, number 60 to number 112. It has Botswana, Sri Lanka, Mongolia, Cuba. India is not on it. And then you have medium, which is 113 to 151. And India has that as at number 130. Uh, just below Namibia and just above Micronesia in the Pacific. So even if you ignore GDP, you can say GDP is not the only way to measure uh, success of a society. But if you were to now take the Human Development Index, we rank pretty low as well. So the optimist part of me says, we have a lot of headroom to improve. We can learn from what the Vietnams, Bangladeshs, other countries of the world have done in specific parts to say, okay, what is it uh, uh, that we can do? One view that I have is, our interactions with the government are fairly negative, right? There are tax issues, encroachment issues, you know, there's heavy handedness on the part of the government. That's what the common man experiences. But if you step away from our day to day experience and look at the data, India's state capacity is actually very weak. Okay. So, India, Indian state is gigantic in terms of regulation, but it is weak in terms of manpower. Okay. And I think that is one of the issues which is holding us back in many ways. So let, let me just give you some statistics to back that. Between 1991 and 2011, our population went from 846 million to about 1.2 billion. Public sector jobs in this time frame went down from 19.1 million to 17.9 million. IAS enrollment went down 10% in this time frame. Police vacancy is 28% depending on which measure you take, which data you take. India has fewer people in the diplomatic corps, and I didn't know this, than Sweden. There are 31 million cases pending in courts, 10% of them for more than 10 years. So these are facts about weak state capacity. As a result of that, we have weak institutions. What do I see as a businessman in our so-called institutions, regulators, and so on and so forth? One, we put conflicting demands on them. Right? So they're torn between balancing way too many factors. Two, they're catching up to market realities. So something happens in the telecom sector, the regulator catches up. Something happens in uh, big data, regulator ca uh, 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 catches up, and so on and so forth. Third, the most solutions that I've seen have had two themes. One, there is a crisis, and we'll have a good solution in a backdrop of a crisis. A second thing, theme that I've seen is you will have individual heroism in otherwise failing institutions. So you'll have one great police officer, one great uh, diplomat who will do something, one great something, but those are not institutionalized. And what's carrying our country forward is either a crisis-related solution or individual brilliance. So let's project into the future. So let's assume we're in 2050. Normal math and economic forecasting will tell you that we'll be a 28 trillion economy by then. Okay. And as one of my BJP friends was joking, if you're not there, we can round the number up. <laughs> This is 10x from today. And this is not wishful thinking. This is pretty much extrapolating from where we've been. Our per capita income will be about $17,000, which is slightly higher than where Greece is today.
the big advantage of all this will be our purchasing power will shoot through the roof. So think of a middle class Indian. Let's assume my salary is $100. And let's assume I spend $80 in what are we call in Hindi roti kapra or makan, which are day to day necessities. And $20 is disposable income. And let's assume I have 5% real wage growth. So I may have 8%, 9% nominal wage growth, or you'll take away inflation. So let's assume I have 5% real wage growth. So my income went from 100 to 105 in real terms. My disposable income just increased by 25%. So you may have 5% real wage growth, but you may have millions of Indians crossing the threshold where their disposable income growth is 20%, 30%, and so on and so forth. And therefore, you'll have an automotive boom, as we've seen, and we're not talking about the last two quarters. No. You'll have an insurance sector boom. You'll have a consumer boom showing up in various. And that trend is not going to change because we have a drought. It will change for that year. It will not change for the long term. It will not change because oil goes up or down, and so on and so forth. So that, to me, is what keeps me optimistic <coughs> during tough times, that this long-term trajectory is actually very, very good. However, there are some caveats. If you look at Southern and Western India, they're growing about 12% faster than Eastern and Northern India. If you ask insurance companies about their uh, issues, they will say North is a bad market because of various issues of fraudulent claims, etc. So you have this divide coming up where the South and West are breaking away just like Vietnam broke away from other developing countries as compared to the East and North. So you may have a situation where a Tamil Nadu voter is looking at the situation and saying, my tax rupees go to fund something in Eastern Uttar Pradesh? I don't get it. Why? And that question we will, as a society, have to address no matter what in the face of that prosperity. This will be a problem of prosperity in Tamil Nadu. Okay. <coughs> South already has uh, uh, declining dependency ratios, which means they will invest more, they will grow faster, and it is a self-reinforcing cycle. The other challenge that I see is we are already a very high population density. Mm -hmm. So our population density is 450 people per square kilometer, comparing that to China at 150, Indonesia at 145, Brazil at 25. Okay. Now this population density gives us less degrees of freedom to operate and prosper than the other countries. So you'll have battle for water, which is really a function of uh, uh, population density. You'll have urban versus rural, industry versus agriculture. And these battles will be a little bit more pronounced in our country just because of this. Now, I hear fancy projections about solar, for example. And I wonder, where will this growth in solar come from? Because the raw material for solar is obviously sunlight, but it's also land. It is a very land-intensive industry. So given our reality of our population and size, I wonder how some of these things will uh, play out. I was reading an article a couple of years ago in um, uh, Foreign Policy. So this is a 2012 article in Foreign Policy written by a Harvard professor called Stephen Walt. And he says the solution for, he talks more about international relations, but he says the solution that for the world's problems that we attempt all the time is Confucianism. Not Confucianism as in the Chinese Confucius, but Confucianism. So let's get used to Confucianism as we grow into the 21st century. And he says that this trumps all other isms, capitalism, socialism, because confusion reigns over all of these. And he gives reasons. So when we, it's very easy for us to sit in this room and criticize decision makers in government or business. Because we sit isolated from the day-to-day -day pressures of those trade-offs that these people have to make. So we'll appreciate some of the policy mistakes. We'll, appreciate some of the corporate mistakes if we believe in confusion. So this is my caveat for all my sins. One 
there are new circumstances and new realities which are emerging and people have to respond to those and there's natural confusion if we were thrown into new situations right? so policy makers business leaders are thrown into new situations second we are overwhelmed by the news of today whatever is going on today so there's little time to plan strategies are more reactive than they ought to be and that's the nature of a lot of policy formulation third very often we are blinded by ideology we have taboo topics it takes time to break away from those taboo topics you can go into rural villages in india today and it's difficult for them for us to motivate them to send their girls to school after they reach puberty because there's this cultural barrier so we've ended up building toilets in schools exclusively for girls so that girls can go to school so there's a problem here but the solution was over here okay. and success breeds overconfidence so because we grew fast in the 2000 2008 period it gave us a sense of overconfidence that there's something innate about us which could not go wrong I'll make two closing comments on the country level and then I'll come to the uh, uh, business side. One was said by Elizabeth Warren who's a presidential candidate now. Science has a culture of doubt. Religion has a culture of faith. And in countries such as India we have to balance both. Now it's well known we've all studied history. Europe broke away from the rest of the world during the industrial revolution or preceding it during the renaissance and the industrial revolution thereafter. because they went into rational thinking rather than the thinking of the past so you can attribute all sorts of reasons as to why that happened but that is what broke europe away many developing countries our country particularly suffers a lot we have a lot of non rational traditional thinking and it may not be in this conference room here but when you are going out and seeking votes as a member of parliament or as an mla you have to respond to that thinking on the other side clinton made a very interesting statement when he was leaving the presidency and they asked him what are you planning to do next he says you know when i what i want to do next is return as the bond market because it dominates everything it is more powerful than the president of the united states so as indian businessmen policy makers citizens we have to realize that there are financial markets out there they will respond we can see how the stock markets have responded to the budget we we will see how markets respond to us policy options in japan how they responded and so on and so forth so it's a good barometer not the only barometer we need to look at but it's a good barometer to to uh, as a mirror to keep us aligned with what we ought to do now let me come to business how we think about business how we ought to think about business for the 21st century so i'll bring you take you back to a 1980 film called 9 to 5 with dolly parton and there's a song in it which i think all of us should have as the national anthem these days is called pour yourself some ambition So when I look at the Indian business community there is this sense of despondency about growth about things so if you look at facts of capacity utilization at one level capacity utilization levels in industry after industry are actually pretty good mm-hmm. yet if you look at the capex cycle it's one of the worst periods for the capex cycle and why is high capacity utilization not translating into new capex is because we lack the confidence as the business community today to make these investments and there may be various reasons for that so for some reason we've got to get this uh, we've got to get out of this vicious circle and we've got to get ambition back so perhaps all of you should see the song it's quite an inspiring song and i ask my friends always i think half the room were probably born a couple of decades after dolly parton said that song oh yeah that's true actually <laughs> so going back to classical economics a growth rate will be our investment rate divided by the incremental capital output ratio and the investment rate is really controlled by the business community and the mood of the business community and so on and uh, so forth now in the 40s and 50s it was said what's good for general motors 
is good for America. If I were to translate that into today and in India, I would say what's good for Maruti is good for India. India. Because Maruti is really a proxy on where the Indian middle class is headed. Right? More and more people are coming into the Indian middle class. More and more people are aspiring to buy cars and so on and so forth. And therefore, I believe that businesses that cater to the Indian middle class, upper, lower, middle, middle, the whole set, will actually do very well. I'll come to some examples of where I see changes happening and so on and so forth. Now, there are four different transformations happening in India this, that businesses need to address for their consumers. One, there's a transformation happening for many people from agriculture to industry. Right? That's one end of the pyramid at the bottom. The Unilevers of the world are trying to address that. And one of the reasons why Hero gained market share over Bajaj in, in, the, in the last two decades, they bet on rural markets much more than the Bajajas of the world in early days. And that's how they became the largest motorcycle manufacturer in the world, mind you, today, in the world. So that's one big transformation that even today we can capitalize on. It's not over. That move is not over. Nowhere near over. The second is from industrial to information technology. Digital. To digital. Okay. I'll give you examples. Look at urbanization levels and where they are changing. Look at service economy workers. We've invested in a, a company called Rento Mojo. Rento Mojo rents furniture to young professionals who are seeking work in banking or IT or here or there. Because they are transient, they don't want to be owning, settled with that furniture. So there are opportunities coming as you look at people moving from industrial to the knowledge economy. There's another transition that is happening. It is happening from the information economy to the imagination economy. And imagination economy can be creative fields. So Netflix is going to spend billions of dollars on content creation. So you can go capitalize on that as a producer today. Zara has shifted the game in the apparel industry because of imagination. They are saying, we will keep res less inventory. Okay. We will run out of stock. It doesn't matter. Why should I have the same stock at every store? For me, rotation of my capital is more important. Return on capital employed is a more important variable. And they've just rethought. So it's a victory of imagination in an otherwise industrial type Business. old economy business. Okay. The Paytms and the Olas obviously do that. You've seen that. There's this sense of despondency today about where's the growth. You've seen the Unilever figures that were much below their average 5% growth last. Uh, they just announced their figures and so on. And so forth. But let me see, show you growth where I see it. Okay. So I'm looking at the optimistic side of the table. There are reasons perhaps to worry, but I'm showing you the optimistic side of the table. So there's a company which is in kind of distress called Religare. You all heard of it. Religare is a financial services, used to be a financial services conglomerate, is on the verge of bankruptcy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Beneath that, there is a company called Religare Healthcare, uh, Health Insurance, which is a health insurance let me give you some statistics on the growth of Religare Health Insurance in the face of all the difficulties the parent is facing. And insurance is a trust product. I'll buy insurance from you because I trust you. So in spite of all the difficulties of trust that they may be facing, in 2016, their gross written premium, which is the revenue they earned by premium that people paid, was 503 crores. In 2019, it was 1,843 crores. This is a company with a weak parent who people should not trust. Winning business profitably. They've just turned profitable. So for all the worry out there, this is the kind of growth a handicapped player is playing. Religare is handicapped in many ways. 
Now let's just come to Amazon and Flipkart for a second. Amazon's revenues in India were a billion dollars in 2015. 2018 was 7.5 billion. Okay. Flipkart was 2.1 billion in 2015, 6.1 billion in 2018. So this is the kind of growth, even though a Unilever revenue may be plateauing, you're seeing. And sure. what are these guys selling? They're selling normal consumer products, book shirts, this, that. There's a company you may not have heard of, but it's products you may have used uh, called Vinnie Cosmetics. Vinnie Cosmetics makes the fog brand of deodorant. The thesis eight years ago was the deodorant market is growing very fast, but it is small enough where the PNGs and Unilevers of the world will not focus on it. And therefore, it's an empty space for us to go and conquer. This company started eight years ago. Last year, revenues of 1,200 crores. From scratch, zero eight years ago. Okay. Profits, slightly under 150 crores. In November of 2017, Sequoia and Westbridge bought some of the old investors out, etc., etc., and put new money in. And the company was valued at 4,000 crores. So from zero, so in five and a half years, he had created a 4,000 crore value. A nice, good you businessman in Ahmedabad. We invest with a person called Vishal Uttam in Bombay. Vishal so led a group of investors who invested in that. The group of investors made 20x in five and a half years of their investment. So this is the Vietnam type story that within India that is happening. Let me give you a smaller company. So there's a company called Boat. There's a company called Boat. It makes headphones. So all of you should try these headphones. These are thousand rupee headphones. You can plug it onto your phone, into your computer. And when they're forcing you to do all this silly work, you can hear music. Thousand rupee price point, catering to Indian masses. 2017, 27 crores of revenue. 2018, 108 crores in revenue. And if I remember right, I don't have the data. 2019, it was about 200 odd crores in revenue. One product, niche headphones. I don't know their geographic distribution. I'm pretty sure they're not even pan India yet. Brand new company. Okay. So, to me, within all the despondency, there are these stories that are playing out simultaneously. Now let's come back to the macro a little bit. Which are the top three performing stock markets in the world in dollar terms over 25 years? Depending on which measure you take, India is number two or number three over 25 years in dollar terms after rupee depreciation, after all kinds of good and bad things that happen in the world economy or India. Nifty, over 25 years, has delivered 10.37% in dollar terms. People who know the hedge fund industry in the US well will tell you the whole hedge fund industry in the US on aggregate makes less money than this in US dollar terms. And here's just a passive Nifty. Compared to Shanghai, 6.9% over 25 years. I mean, you compound a 4% difference over 25 years, it's a huge difference. And there's a reason why the Indian stock market is the second or the third best performing. The contest is between Germany and um, uh, India because there are some data of X dividend come dividend, therefore there's a little bit of confusion as to what's the, uh, whether it's India two, number two or number three. Who's the number one? US. Okay. So there's a reason why India's stock market is the best performing. Not because it's the darling of stock investors. Return on capital employed in Indian businesses on aggregate for nifty companies is 15%. 15% return on capital employed is a very big number. So it'll have capital light businesses, such as consumer companies. It'll capital heavy businesses, such as power companies, and so on and so forth. But aggregate, 15%. Emerging markets average return on capital employed, slightly under 11%. 
So that's the nature of the Indian economy. It's a, Indian businesses over long periods of time actually do very well. This is 25 year data. So I'll ask you a trick question. Look at the Forbes billionaires list from India. And I'm looking at it from one year ago. Uh, there are hundred odd uh, billionaires. Which produced more billionaires? Automotive or tech? If I didn't know better, I would say obviously tech, but here are the facts. 2018 list, there were eight tech billionaires, 11 automotive sector billionaires. There were billionaires from financial services, there were billionaires from industry, you know. So in India, the old economy actually works wonders. And I always joke with foreigners when they come here, saying, look, I'm maximum bullish about India. Because I can make money in basic industries in India, which are very mature industries in most of the Western world. Anyway, we study the new economy, right? Just because I think there are lessons from the changes that the new economy is seeing. So mid of last year, Flipkart was sold, as you know, to Walmart for 16 billion. It was the largest e-commerce acquisition in the world. Axel, which was an early investor, Tiger Management, which was uh, Tiger Global, which was an early uh, investor, made 400 times their investment in Flipkart. So let me just share with you some of the lessons I learned from Flipkart, which are applicable to all of industry. First, Flipkart had deep insight. They made bets with insight. So the insight was connectivity of the internet will improve. It will go deep into India. In 2007, when they made this bet, when Flipkart started, it was not obvious. It's obvious today. Right? That's the first bet they made. Second, they made the same bet operating leverage of the consumer. Consumption will increase. Disposable incomes are growing very fast. Third bet they made was logistics will improve and cost of delivery will actually fall. All these three bets played out. By 2017, we knew all these bets are playing out. Issue was, who made that bet in 2007? They bet on niches very selectively. They said there are two things we will make money on. Fashion, uh, electronics and fashion, in that order. So bulk of their money spent, bulk of their business came from these two. So it was not just a pie in the sky strategy. Oh, it's cool to be online. Let's do it and let's experiment. It was far more well thought out than that. Second lesson that I've learned personally, there is a culture of trust which works two ways in these new economy companies, which all of us ought to learn if you want to conquer the century. One, as owners of a business, you have to trust the management that they can do a good job. A middle manager can do a good job. A junior manager can do a good job, not just senior management. So amount of responsibility that was given to middle management in these new economy companies such as Flipkart was much more than what we traditionally would be comfortable in giving in a steel company or a, a patent, regular old economy apparel company or whatever. It worked the other way. The middle management and junior management at Flipkart was secure enough to say, look, I will make mistakes. I'll learn from this. I'm not going to get fired. In an old economy company, most people are risk averse because they're saying, if I make this mistake, it'll hurt my career. So to me, that was one of the great sources of dynamism for these kinds of companies. Three, and again, I've used this in our office all the time now. The flip cards of the world plan consciously for 10x growth. I've got X revenue. What does it take to go to 10x? You've got to change everything. The incrementalism will not take us from X to 10X, whether I'm a, a market leader or a market aspirant, whether I'm a country or a business. So in business school, we were taught a model. It was called the Galbraith star model. It said a company consists of strategy, structure, people, decision-making processes, reward systems with an overlay of symbols. This is what a company is. It's called the Galbraith star model. 
So when you go from X to 10X, you can't tinker with one of these. You've got to change all of them in sync pretty much to be able to achieve that 10X. And we've tried to incorporate that in our own offices, our own companies, to see how we can go from X to 10X. The fourth thing that I've learned from these young businesses is tenacity. In 2017, Flipkart was doing down rounds. Investors were marking their positions down. Mm -hmm. In 2018, <coughs> Flipkart gets acquired for $16 billion, the largest e-commerce acquisition in the world. Because they kept at it. Because they kept at it. If you look at the NBFC space today, a lot of companies are having existential dilemmas. Okay. Right? Guess what? The bajajas of the world, which are gods of this business today, have had existen existential dilemmas in their past. You've got to be able to rise above and fight through, rise above the moment, fight through that uh, temporary situation. To say, oh, this guy is in trouble, is easy to dismiss. Every company which is great has gone through some element of trouble. The fifth thing I've learned is alchemy. The alchemy, as you know, is the science of turning ordinary metal into gold. Right? So entrepreneurs I meet, they have infectious optimism. And it infects us. I met this um, uh, insurance company a couple of weeks ago, online insurance, digital insurance company called ACO. I was so excited after that meeting because of the infectious optimism of the founders. You know, they used to say when Steve Jobs was alive, he has a reality distortion field around him. So he walks in and people start going gaga. Okay. In our own way, yeah. that becomes self-fulfilling. Right? It became self-fulfilling for him. So we've got to be able to create this sense of <laughs> reality distortion field around us to be able to capitalize on it. In, let's say I was looking at this 20 years ago. I would say this company has legacy assets. It can build. This company doesn't have those assets. It may be at a disadvantage. Over time, I've realized, realized that the legacy assets are not worth much. The human spirit of the entrepreneur will win over legacy assets. So let's assume I'm an old economy business trying to go into the new economy. I have legacy assets, I have supply chain, I have all the advantages. But the new economy company has the spirit, in spite of all the disadvantages of lacking supply chain, this, that, and the other, they may win simply on that spirit. So we've got to inculcate that spirit in our old economy businesses. Another trend we found, and it may be applicable to industry after industry, there are no products. Increasingly, products are becoming services. So if you look at transportation, Ola's and Ubers of the world have taken a product and said, why do you need a product? I'll give you a service which will mimic the product. You'll have a car when you want it. Tesla has gone one step further. Tesla is saying, you want a better ride? I will improve my software. You can download that software and improve the quality of your ride. I'm saying, hang on, my car won't change? You'll upgrade my car through software? Tesla said, yes. And that's happening. Okay. So more and more product value creation is shifting to services. A software download will help you get a better ride. So we have to focus on EBITDA. So the joke these days doing the rounds on Twitter and WhatsApp is what does EBITDA stand for? Exit before it tumbles down again. <laughs> so we've got to come out of that mindset and focus on building our businesses and uh, you know, uh, getting back to the old world EBITDA. So let me now come to the personal level. So I have a little quote stuck in my office, which says, which says um, and by the way, um, in 2000, when I was asked, uh, invited to be a global uh, leader for tomorrow, which was the program at the World Economic Forum, we had to go and give a talk. That was the YGL equivalent. Equivalent of what the YGL is today. So this quote was on my wall even then. So I actually and you quoted good, from there. You were a good 35, 34 at that time. Right? So the quote is, 
The challenge before all of us at a personal level <coughs> is to balance the discipline that is needed for survival with the chaos that is needed for progress. If we have way too much discipline, we'll be far too conservative to conquer. If we have way too much chaos, right, we'll blow something up along the way. Right? So this balance, no matter what field we are in, no matter what industry we are in, we've got to be able to find. And by the way, if you look at Shell oil as an example, Shell's motto is survival, motto number two, progress. Shell deals with big risks. They have big capex. They deal with huge sing swings in commodity prices. Right? They have to make long-term bets. So their bet is we have to be conservative first. Right? We are able to play counter-cyclical because uh, we are conservative. Warren Buffett says, lesson number one, never lose money. Lesson number two, never forget lesson number one. <laughs> you know? So you've got to be able to balance discipline and chaos. Two, and I tell this to my kids all the time, I'm way past it to learn it myself. The most important trait managers, individuals in this economy need is versatility. So at Google and other companies, you have these positions of product management. Who's a good project manager? He's a good techie. But he's not a very good techie. He need not be. A good techie. A good techie. And he conquers the boundary between technology and marketing. What do the consumers need? What will people pay for this? Will this be a distraction? And people who can transcend those two make the best product managers. And if you look at where most of the top management at Google has come from, it's come from the product management teams, the people who have been good product managers. So that's the nature where you can transcend various fields. The third point I want to make, and it's a very subtle but important point. We tend to confuse intelligence with rationality. And I've found time again, intelligent people do the same irrational things that dumb people do. Because intelligence is a measure of IQ. It's not a measure of day-to-day -day behavior. So you've got to be able to segregate that. We have to try to be more intelligent and try to be more rational. So there's this hedge fund manager who's actually more well-known as an author called Nassim Nicholas Taleb, you've heard of. He runs a reasonably successful hedge fund. He's written He's spoken the here. book, Black Swan. He's spoken over here. So he has a comment. It's, the comment is the prediction is wrong only if it costs us something. And it is right only if it makes us something. Everything else is just talk. So from all this, I hope you'll be able to make something out of it. And therefore, some of these predictions, we will all get together and make them come true. So thank you. Open to Q&A. So why don't you guys come in here? Just quickly introduce yourself and pose anything that you want to post to him. And if there is a slack, I think Gautam has plenty to post. So Gautam gets raring to pose. You know, Gautam, you want to ask? Yeah. I know, because I could, see, I could see it on his face. He had like three questions there. <laughs> You, you can take a seat so that they're recording it so you can sit there yeah. you can sit you can keep sitting there and asking the question uh, thank you Gaurav extremely illuminating and at a, in such dark times that we are facing today and uh, which with which uh, when we write we try to empathize with businesses as job creators wealth creators and so on and we see only darkness around this is truly a, a ray of light and hope, and it's wonderful to see this enthusiasm. Thank you. Uh, having said that, since you are an investor in several companies through your private equity firm, as well as your own businesses, I just wanted to ask you one or two questions. First, uh, well, you already answered the first part through your presentation, which is business risk. Let me ask you the second part, which is, what is the level of regulatory risk in India today, uh, which is different from what was earlier. We are getting a sense that there is an excessive over-regulation, um, entrepreneurs being looked at as uh, criminals, um, SFIO and ED becoming the first, uh, first call of regulation rather than 
the uh, traditional regulatory agencies. There is panic and to uh, finish that panic, you need exemplary uh, actions by the government and therefore uh, putting a few uh, high profile people behind bars is a better uh, politics or maybe better political economy than fixing a problem uh, which requires far more endurance and uh, long-term vision. So uh, that's the first thing. Uh, do you see it basic? Uh, uh, I've been studying businesses from all uh, and written a book on some seven decades of policy making. And I've seen that serially the laws that we have been making right from 1947 intensively through the 1970s under Indira Gandhi, even today, uh, in spirit are the same. And uh, just to illustrate, uh, the jail term for uh, CSR. CSR. Uh, this is, uh, again, a, a, a reminder of uh, jail terms for, for instance, uh, if you write MRP instead of maximum retail price, I, I'm sure you know there's, there were two entrepreneurs who were going to be jailed. And uh, finally, the uh, Odisha High Court, oh, sorry, Andhra Pradesh High Court came and protected them that it, MRP is OK. So these kind of coercive laws, how, do you see any particular change in, in today's dispensation, which is different from what was earlier? Do they need to be changed? What is your suggestion? Uh, what are the global practices on looking uh, on criminal uh, imprisonment uh, for crimes that are civil? I think you kind of also plays into what we were discussing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, how do you believe that we have the regulatory space to have chaos and discipline both? Yes. Can I add? <laughs> yeah, please, please. please. Okay, can we just add something? Please, please. please. So, uh, sorry. So, Mr. thank you for coming and sharing your experience and wisdom with us. Very educative. Uh, you know, you come from a very illustrious line of, uh, of industry. <laughs> And uh, I was actually hoping to get a personal view, you know. You told us how times have changed. But what is the personal view from within the family? Ramkrishna and Dalmia and uh, I forget the name of your other ancestor who built the uh, Dalmia Industries. Jayadeal Dalmia. Jayadeal Dalmia. You know, they were also leaders of their own time, early 20th century. The world was opening up for them too. The world is opening up for you too. Is there any commonality or none whatsoever as far as business leadership is concerned? All the attributes you mentioned. How are you different to your great grandfather? Well, yeah, in short. In short. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> so let me answer the first question, first set of questions, and then I come to come to this. I think we've had a bit of a regulatory overreach the way we are heading today in I terms of criminalization true. of civil <coughs> issues. And to some extent, the business community has brought it upon itself. The reason I believe the business community is partly responsible for this. So if you look at the SME sector, let me divide SME sector into two types of people. You make 100 rupees. You pay taxes on 80 rupees and you don't pay taxes on 20 rupees. You make 100 rupees, you don't pay tax on 80 out of the 100 rupees and pay tax only on 20. So just take, take there are people in two camps. Society as a whole will forgive a person who is not paying tax on 20 rupees. Okay. I'm talking of society as a whole. Yeah. Society as a whole will never forgive a person who is not paying tax on 80 rupees. If you do an honest assessment of what the SME community was doing, there were more people in not paying taxes in the not paying taxes out of 80% of their income, right, than in this camp. So there is this huge issue that dishonest businessmen have to be nailed. Now he can get sucked into that because he was not a part of that, but that's to me collateral damage. I'm not justifying it. I'm saying that's a fact of life. Businesses have behaved in a certain way. There's an overreaction from the regulator as a result of that. right? And there's collateral damage to people on the margin who've done some, who have some problem, but not problems of that magnitude. Our responses are not uh, 
uh, granular. Our responses are not calibrated in that sense as a regulator. I think that there's a second force at play. The government, I'm just talking of taxes for a second, needs income, needs revenue. They have their own problems of deficits, staring them in the face. So one of the reasons they're going all out to collect this, even small amounts of revenue from here and there, okay, are because they are under pressure they in their own finances. Then we come to a related issue. <coughs> Should CSR type violations be criminal activity? And my answer is an absolute no. I think these are political uh, statements, symbolic statements being made for some other audience. I don't think these are rational statements for good governance. They're political statements and I see them as such. And I believe therefore these are transit, they, they are transitory, they will go away. In the event that they don't go away and they accumulate, take that scenario with a 2%, 5%, whatever probability you want to attach to it. In the event that they don't go away, it will be a very long and deep shadow on the Indian economy, on Indian business. But I don't think that is the case that's going to play out. I, I think it may not survive this month. <laughs> it will be good this week. Certainly that's that CSR. Another amendment of the amendment. So I don't think they will uh, expend political capital which they have invested for so long into undoing it within a month or within a year. I think this law is unfortunately here to stay. And at a, any time that uh, an inconvenient promoter or a government that wants to showcase some form of uh, retribution uh, this clause will be evoked and uh, I mean that the threat of going to jail for something which is so uh, let me let me just extend so uh, Gautam double down on the entire CSR thing no, so let me ask you a different question rather than going into CSR on this this is not a CSR debate although we should have it and maybe I think so Gautam we should arrange one I'm but I want to ask you that question that Gautam, the, f the f question that actually Gautam originally raised and the point you made that Indian businesses are uh, having utilizations of 85% but are uh, risk averse to invest capital in new sizes. And isn't this creating exactly that kind of an ecosystem where businesses are going to be loath to invest? You know, when, when, when they see, when you create an antagonistic relationship between the regulator and the government or the censor and the uh, investor. Uh, and uh, now even between the public and the investor, because you know, all of this is actually, see what is happening is when you have a strong political charismatic uh, party in power, you are also turning the public against the private sector. So if private sector is being now painted in a certain color, how instinct, um, how, uh, uh, um, how do you expect them to be more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, say what, do you, what, what was the word you used? Hungry for investing in uh, businesses. If they are seen, they would rather park their money outside. I don't believe the capex cycle is directly correlated to these government actions. I don't think. It may be partly correlated, but I don't think there's a very okay. strong correlation. I think the correlation is more, on the capex cycle, the correlation is more to do with fears of debt, right? Fears, of, India has the highest real interest rates in the world. Today, if inflation is 4%, 5%, and borrowing cost is 9 or 10%, yeah. with 5 6% real interest rate, which capital intensive business can survive? So I think the math for CapEx being subdued is more to do with that. Rather than the regulatory fears? It may be a B level issue. I'm not saying it's not an issue, but I would say that is the A level issue. Okay. I think the uh, issue on these kind of fears is more to do with the debt side, not the tax side. A small issue on debt will be, let's put SFIO, uh, search, raid, etc, etc. Right? All businesses go through cycles. As a society, we still have not segregated uh, a good promoter who's facing a tough time from a bad promoter who had criminal intent. We've not been able to distinguish uh, uh, between the two. So there's a criminalization of bankruptcy, which is an overarching theme which I think needs to correct and it will, it will over time. I think just time will correct it because courts will be overwhelmed the way we are going, you know, and CLT courts will be overwhelmed. People will also realize jobs will get lost. So I think we've overreacted and that will correct. Now, as far as these 
other issues are concerned that oh bad credit rating let's uh, uh, arrest the credit rating analyst correct or you've not met your csr uh, targets let's do that those i think are just unexplainable to me no it's worse than that you see uh, if you look at the markets a company is supported by various other institutions credit rating agencies you just mentioned but let us look at auditors until yesterday we, there was some, something known as the big four today we are left with big two because deloitte and constant young have been Impen- debarred for five and two years yeah. respectively so uh, uh, this this entire business of turning entire industries out of uh, like, uh, I don't know how, how to articulate this, but for one problem, you kill an industry or a whole fleet of auditors or credit rating uh, professionals or independent directors. Seven hundred independent directors have resigned ju- just because of this risk on their heads. I'm not sure if this is the right way, and if there is, uh, I mean, what uh, what would you do? Suppose you were the finance secretary. Well, thank God, I'm not the finance secretary. <laughs> but, uh, how would you fix this? I mean, you know, this this trust deficit is killing uh, business and jobs. See, I look at this as a pendulum, and I think the pendulum has swung in one direction, in an extreme direction, and it will swing back. Okay, so if it stays where it is at today, we'll have very serious problems. But as an evolving society, I think the pendulum will swing, and that uh, maybe it's a bit of a leap of faith on my part, but that's what I believe. And therefore, I'm not overly concerned that that is our defining characteristic. It is a uh, encumbrance. It's a nuisance. It's a big problem, and so on. But it's not going to be a defining. Fair enough. I, I think you said you you started this talk by saying that you're an optimist. Yeah. You're a professional optimist, and I think that's that that's you believe this is uh, this is a moment that too shall pass. Uh, so let me ask you a more specific question. Uh, do you believe that in the, the current engagement between industry and government is healthy? Uh, and how would you rate it vis-a-vis your engagement with government say 10 years ago so in a decade has india the nature of engagement between industry and government in terms of coming up with policies or or certain proposals has that changed and I perhaps think, uh, in other countries in and, and say in other countries how would you yeah, so we have to look at the singapore model as a best case best practice some in something like this so if you were to go to singapore <laughs> bureaucrats come from or get paid what private sector guys paid bureaucrats consider private sector people as their peers right and so on and so forth uh, bureaucrats run some very successful companies owned by the tamasics and gics in, in singapore so the level of interaction is deeper healthier and so on and so forth. in india uh, level of interactions between business and government have actually reduced mm-hmm. as we know mm-hmm. There's been this tendency that businesses have manipulated government, mm. have manipulated the system, and therefore there's an aversion to right. business. Mm-hmm. The BJP government was far more right traditionally than where it is today. I think I think of this as a political spectrum. They move left, they have decimated the left. They have no other place to go but to come more right. That's the optimist in me speaking, <laughs> right? Because the challenges to the current regime will come from their right wing. Correct. Right, there's nobody left in the on left on the left to challenge them. Yeah, there and the natural instincts are more right of center than so left. So I would think this will course correct on its own. Got the second. And point I don't want to go to prison. So <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the second point that you raised was weak institutions. Now, one of the questions we discuss quite vigorously and rigorously at ORF is this whole idea of India's economic growth far outpacing institutional growth and its capacity to beef up its. Uh, carders or its officers or its, its uh, uh, you know uh, even its uh, uh, private sector uh, uh, capabilities uh, and many of us increasingly believe that uh, these governance vacuums will have to be filled by uh, non traditional institutions for example many think tanks are doing a lot of track 2 track 1.5 sometimes track 1 work for government many academic institutions are doing Uh, the incubation work for niti ayog and others you know so they you are seeing in for non traditional institutions doing more governance work these days industry has to be one of those institutions that does get involved with more governance work uh, the general belief is that our businesses are are pathetic in terms of global standards when it comes to giving back to society and i think that belief 
also allows regulators to uh, to you know sometimes create these overreach in terms of policies and regulation as a person who has seen businesses grow over a family which has seen three generations do different kinds of work do you think there is now a growing appetite to give back has that changed our indian you know there's a accusation that indian businesses are not uh, are not good at uh, giving their they only give their earnings to the children they don't give it back to um, uh, the, yeah, the key causes that the country is grappling with yeah so how has that changed has that changed so let's look at one trend so if you look at ngos think tanks and these actors as a percentage of thought leadership as a percentage of gdp whichever measure you can take clearly around the world it's increasing ngos think tanks is playing a much bigger role in the world today country after country right and the same is happening in india and i think it will happen even more in india because of the vacuum and the gaps that are there if you look at giving more individualistic societies give a lot more okay so america i would argue is the most individualistic society in the world today level of giving there is much higher within these societies within any society more individualistic people will give more so if you look at the tech entrepreneur community within india their portion of giving is much more than traditional business housing proportion of their own network so that's to do with the innate character of the person right whether it's at the so- social society level or it is at a individual level and i think as indian businesses evolve even traditional family businesses are giving more traditionally they used to give around their perimeter so let's say i have a plant i will do an eye camp i will do something for adivasis nearby i will do this that and the other which was very simple direct giving in your direct ecosystem it was not indirect giving for larger national causes i think that is changing right so you will see some of that trend play out it's already correct if you look at data from 10 years ago versus now versus what may happen in 10 years that's happening but i think as a society we are not as individualistic as europe so we will not meet uh, <laughs> as america so we will not meet those standards at least in the old hmm. uh, economy yet there's still time for that and uh, the question that uh, mr alwale asked just in the last yeah so i think you know we talk about this internally all the time so if i were to look at my grandfather's generation just as an argument my grandfather came from chirawa with nothing became a small trader became an industrialist during his time he was amongst the top 2 or 3 or 4 richest people in the country right he was mentioned in freedom at midnight uh, and so on and so forth they were far more risk taking than we are we've been spoiled by our success the inheritance of our success my father my grandfather moved from chirawa to delhi let's say it is akin to me moving from delhi to san francisco for business i would always look at that and say yaar kya darkar hai yahan se kar lete hain etc etc right so they were able to take that risk a second thing which we are trying to inculcate in our cells in our children and so they were far more idealistic if you looked at competitive sharp elbow practices between between the business community at that time or between business and government at that time it was not there compared to what it is today there was a sense of nation idealism perhaps it was a by product of the freedom movement but that was the reality of that time so th- i think those are two big differences between then and now Does anyone else want to come in? Uh, and I can see Sushant, Manish, uh, Niranjan. Okay, so we'll bring three people in, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, can we take three yeah, yeah, together? Yeah, yeah. And then we'll come back to you for the final round because I have to leave you at twelve. Yes. So Manish, uh, Sushant, Manish, and then Niranjan. Okay. Uh, so your optimism is very infectious, <laughs> but uh, you know I don't know why, what you are so optimistic about. <laughs> so it's very good figures you are quoting, but look, we have a government which worships poverty. which celebrates poverty right and uh, you have a third world country which wants to have the most liberal first world laws whether it's on labor on a range of other issues it's a fundamental disconnect 
and i don't see how you're going to get around it and frankly you know i marvel all businessmen in this country and i've often told gautam this that i think if anybody deserves a bharat ratna it's a guy who does business in this country <laughs> because the kind of obstacles which are put in the path like a bharat ratna plus a bravery award <laughs> yeah a, a paramveer chakra <laughs> plus bharat ratna you know it's it's the businessman who deserves it you know you're building a building an accident happens you go to jail it's bizarre the kind of things we are doing out here so i i don't know what you're optimistic about but good luck to you I, I think that's not a question. That's a comment. No, so, it's actually uh, there are a whole lot of other questions, but I think yeah, but they're all related to that. Okay. okay, Manish. So Shant writes on um, India Pakistan. That's why he's. I do all the depressing stuff. So, <laughs> so I'm just giving you a context yeah. to where he comes from. Yeah, thank you for your wonderful information. I have been here on Munish Bill for a very long time. We in the diaspora in India right now. So uh, we always talk about uh, moving towards moving towards the helpless or even from a linear point. But what are the challenges we are facing right now in the sector, and how to overcome that? And do you uh, see any leadership role to play in the sector? Because well, I don't find anyone who is very very focused in the sector to you know revive this further. Yeah, so we are not seeing big companies and big leaders come out and talk about circularity and waste management, and you know. So we have seen some sporadic small startups do some work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let, let me come to Niranjan in the end. Niranjan works on uh, democracy and uh, uh, political uh, governance, politically yeah. politics and governance. Uh, <coughs> sir, uh, uh, I have a <coughs> question uh, directly uh, looking at the business politics nexus in this country. Oh yeah, sorry. He's also been writing on how uh, businesses finance elections and the whole so corrupt funding, cycle political of corruption. Yeah. So last election we are tracking actually very closely some of the. Speak onto the mic. Keep yeah, the mic. Political uh, yeah, funding yeah, sources. Uh, so all your model of you know political funding is largely what you know is uh, through electoral trust, which was looking more transparent. You know, last seven eight years like a uh, lot of companies formed electoral trust and they then they started routing money. to different political parties and at least there people used to know who is donating to whom now you have a new instrument called electoral bonds which has come and completely anonymous you know th that uh, donors need not have to reveal anything and this was something the finance minister said that you know to basically infuse uh, the system with white money because black money is the major you know problem but with this now what's happening in last uh, uh, election time we actually tracked about there have been in just four months 6000 crores have actually come through electoral bonds and then money that was flowing through electoral trust have come down so lot of basically those monies are basically by the corporates because uh, each uh, each actually electoral bonds you know if you look at the donation amount is more than 10 lakh so you can easily make sure that it's not individual you know uh, like non corporate it must be basically a. so now this is actually where the problem is So you are actually probably seeing a new model where actually this uh, what we used to call chronic capitalism and other things is now taking a different shape. So the impact of this uh, will have a lot of impact on uh, policies and governance because uh, uh, last UPA government was rocked actually on many of these you know scandals were basically business politics nexus. Now what is your comment? Is it a really India is actually going backward in this in this way? And why business is reluctant to donate actually you know openly and more in a more transparent way because that is what uh, 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 Mr. Jetley said that you know business is still hesitant because they don't want to reveal their name because the government can actually be vindictive. Is that a real actually kind of perception? See, all the money flows to BJP anyways. Why don't they, they come out openly and say? I mean, anyways, all the anonymous money is flowing to the same party. <laughs> so let me take that first question yeah, first. Yeah, the circularity one. So, you know, I don't know much about uh, solid waste management and so on and so forth, but I think there are two issues. one is the government interface at the local municipal level that uh, that is required you need long term contracts you can't say here's a 3 year contract and do it it won't happen and i think that's a big issue second issue is also enforcement so we looked at a, a solid waste management uh, uh, type of business uh, i can't remember which cities they were operating in and their revenues were lower much lower than what they had originally forecast because a lot of the high calorific value waste mm. was actually stolen so 
So you have a contract, Correct. you can look at the city and say, this is the kind of high calorie value but stuff that I will pick away. up, but they are pilfered away. So it's a, then an execution issue. So it's a complex problem. Part of it is the design of the contracts themselves. Second is enforcement of those contracts. And they have to be solved at the city level. And I do believe a lot of innovation can yeah. happen at the city level and is happening at the city level. We don't need the central and the state governments because it's a very local problem. So you can innovate and solve these uh, problems. Now, coming to the bigger problem of election funding, you know, I am not an economist or a political scientist to be able to have any view. So my view is a little bit more derived from what I've read and heard from other people or a little bit what my own common sense tells me. I think there are two forces at play which need to be sorted. One is Indian, we have to recognize how much Indian elections cost. We are not recognizing. Election Commission is in La La Land when they give out these figures. Right. Once you recognize, government has to fund, the state has to fund the bulk of that. That's how you'll keep the system honest. The checks and balances that are there in other countries where the same things happen, I don't know how those checks and balances happen, but we are opening ourselves to all kinds of regulatory capture by doing this. Second. And I think that trend is already playing out a little bit in India. We've had professional politicians for the longest time. Most other countries which have done well don't have professional politicians. They'll have politicians who are eminent lawyers or this or that and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, the eminent lawyer types in India don't win their elections. So they're dependent <laughs> on the party uh, machinery, <laughs> right? So as you get people with, from, with other careers coming into politics, the need to tap outside money will also go down. So I really don't have a view on how to keep it transparent, why, you know, but I think these are the two things that we have to attack. Firstly, honestly assess that number, provide state funding and get more non-career political types into the politics. Yeah, you had a, you had a one finger intervention. Uh, we have to close now, so last. Uh, uh, Abhijit, if you can uh, phrase it in 10 words, yes. <laughs> Uh, very very short. Uh, one uh, in your enthusiasm, you know, I just lost track that that you are a private equity investor and uh, private equity investors invest in a certain way. Uh, the cafe coffee day incident is in front of us. In in addition to that, we have seen investors push entrepreneurs beyond limits. To give you an example, uh, push for turnover rather than uh, yeah. net profits or uh, uh, return on capital employed. Doesn't matter if you make, uh, lose money, get market share. In the end, the entrepreneur loses his company and his shirt. Uh, just just uh, how bad or how good is it? How much pressure do you put as a, uh, individually and as an industry, uh, as an industry practice? You see, I, I think I addressed this point a little bit indirectly when I said there's a difference between intelligence and rationality. Okay, intelligent people make the same irrational decisions. <coughs> private equity has a problem. Firstly, private equity is a great force for economic development. Bharati Telecom would not have existed if Warburg Pincus didn't exist in the right. early days. Okay. And you can say that about an N number of successful uh, companies. Private equity has a problem, which we all have to appreciate and entrepreneurs have to appreciate that the most, and they do it the least. Private equity has a limited shelf life. A private equity fund is a 10-year fund or an 8-year fund or whatever it is. Let's say it's a 10-year fund and they invest in you at the end of year three of their fund life. They have seven remaining years. Now, given the way this game is set up, five years thereafter, which is in their eighth year, they will start chatpatawing ke year exit chahiye. Right? By the year nine of their fund life, they will put the pressure even more. By year 10, they'll come to you as the tax man. You know, okay, this is my right. And you have clauses for exit, but let's say the market is not permitting an exit for whatever reasons. So the pressure will come on. And that's the good and the bad. That's the way private equity is set up. Now, we operate a little differently. Most of our capital is our own. Yes. Is our own. We don't have a fund life. Okay. So we can invest with a 10. Suppose this 10-year fund life has to become 15. No problem. We've held on to investment for 15, 15 years. Because in India or in most countries, building businesses takes that long. Right? And the solution to that may be replacing one private equity with another. Right? So private to private transactions also. And you do that as well? We do that as well. We buy out private equity. 
So, uh, if one or two are the success stories, uh, that today, because of the slowdown and the pressures and the other problems, we are now focusing on the eight who don't make it. And, uh, and the, uh, another allegation on private equity as an industry, and I'm not, I don't know much about your fund, is that they want the upside of equity, but are reluctant to give up the, uh, to, uh, the downside of debt. So, if you don't give us equity, we want a certain return in any case. That is not true. That may be true for a very small subset. Most private equity transactions don't have downside protection. So your standard private equity transaction does not say you have to give me a base return. They ask for an IRR. No. no. That's a projected IRR for investment, there is not no for protection. There is no contracted IRR in most situations. They can come and bug you. You projected, I'll get a 25% IRR. You at least take me out at 18. They can come and bug you. But there is no contract. Which says that I'm talking of most transactions. There are structured credit transactions where you've borrowed money at a high price, but those are not private equity. You have consciously borrowed money at a very high price. There are entrepreneurs who have borrowed money at 18, 20%. Correct. <clears throat> but they've done that consciously. Great. Abhijit, you wanted one sentence? 15 seconds? No, no one sentence. Quick. One se we have five minutes of what time? Oh, okay, the two sentences. The, the, you know, this, uh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, you, uh, I'm glad you talked about uh, the human development, uh, you know, in the beginning. And then our uh, education expense uh, as percentage to GDP, you know, goes around, just barely touches 3% and goes down once again. So government should, ideally speaking, you know, spend more going by the, you know, learnings from East Asian tigers erstwhile and uh, China and you talked about Vietnam and even Sri Lanka. But then that is one part, government part of it. Then what about the private sector? Because till now what we are seeing that, you know, the, whatever private institutes are coming up, they are coming up with a huge and hefty fees, even the good ones of them. So then, you know, the second part of it. So it's a kind of, a, you know, the second part of what Samir asked as the, you know, that inter governance, uh, uh, like a lack of governance vacuum kind of. Uh, so, you know, that, that is the second part of it, that the human capital, uh, you know, whack bomb kind. So, so, let me phrase the question here. The question is that if human capital is the future of India, then why is it that you are only catering to a very small sub-segment of it, which is the elites who can pay you the large fees to enter colleges and universities, then why are you not investing in building a capable India uh, across the, the spectrum of incomes and expenditures? I think… The, pri the private sector, he was talking about the private yeah, sector. I think the private sector is coming at different price points. I do think, I don't have data with me and I don't even have names of institutions who are coming at different price points. But uh, I don't know what lovely so, professional so university's I'm price point is as compared to an Ashoka. I would say that would be a, uh, if you were to take a uh, middle market, a high end and so on, a lovely professional would be in the middle market as compared to Ashoka, <coughs> which would be high end. But why should the private sector want to... Achha, that's a different discussion now. So, Sushant, that you have with Abhijit. So, <laughs> so that's a conversation between the two of you, not with... Uh, 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 they, uh, they clearly belong to... Uh, you know, we have a big tent at ORF, which means that uh, uh, it's discipline and chaos. <laughs> the discipline for a few of us, chaos mostly. <laughs> but... Uh, 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 thank you so much, Gaurav, for uh, the interaction thank this you, morning. I think you were able to uh, put together uh, some ideas that clearly tell us two, since you like the two forces. I think two forces are at work. Both of us see India quite similarly, those sitting in this room, as the opportunities and the big trends that are likely to shift. I think pretty much all of us would have been engaged with some of those trends uh, discreetly in our own work. Uh, but the second force is that I, I don't think that we see so clearly uh, often enough in these rooms, uh, someone who puts his money where his mouth is, uh, being so positive and bullish on this country. I think we don't hear enough of that. We are normally, uh, 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 you know, misery likes company and, uh, and we like visible people. So uh, I think that is the second force that we need to engage more with. That there are people who are going out there putting money and changing this country on a daily basis. There are people who are creating health solutions and health insurances for the mid-markets and bottom of the pyramid. There are people who are creating a whole tech segment with people who consume only $2 of technology every month. And I think that examples that you gave us uh, tell us that public policy cannot be only for 
a hundred million people who will find fault with any arrangement that exists, but for the one billion people who in the next five to seven years will want to transform their lives and uh, uh, hopefully lives of others as well across the world. And I think that infectious optimism as uh, Gautam and Sushant both uh, uh, labeled it is certainly something that uh, those who work on public policy need more of. We don't see enough of this in this room. The infections we get are of a different variety. So thank you so much for infecting us with optimism. Thank and you. Uh, and I think, uh, 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 who was that famous guy, the world in data guy? Uh, Rosling, right? Yeah. I think, Alan Rosling. Uh, Hans, Rosling. Hans, Rosling. Uh, Hans Rosling was a guy who says that I look at the world and I see possibilities. And I think that possibilities is what must drive public policy. And I think you have given us a few possibilities to think about today. Please join me in applauding Gaurav for sparing time on Saturday. Thank you. I have a